So the second group that we look at in our assessment of radical politics in the 1960s is the student new left. The student new left was moved most of all by anger and indignation at what they perceived to be the hypocrisy of the liberals on race, class, and gender. They looked out at a society where they saw Democrats in the North working with Democrats in the South who segregated. They saw liberals claiming to be colorblind, when that's obviously a silly statement. Of course you notice the color of people. In terms of sex, they noticed a society where many young, talented women realized that they were barred from certain occupations. In terms of class, they argued that there needed to be a war on poverty because there was a certain entrenched element of Americans who were mired in poverty in Appalachia as well as in black ghettos. The student who left were the children of the white bourgeois liberals who revolted against their upper middle class parents. There was an increase in the percentage of Americans that went to college. For those having four years of college or more in 1960, 7% rose to 11% in 1970 and 16.2% by 1980. One of the things that characterized this, the children of the liberal parents, was a decline in faith. While the novitiate was at an all time high in the early 1960s in the Catholic Church and religious identification and church attendance were at all-time highs. There was a decline in faith among those who were leaders in those churches. And so existentialism, the philosophy of existentialism, provided an alternative religion in various forms. The first way was in the idea of relationships with other people. Martin Buber had a phrase, I and thou. The idea that you would find religious meaning and purpose in sexual liaisons or in meaningful conversations with others, and you could see God in those relationships. There was also the idea of finding meaning and purpose in the other. Uh, for whites who had lost a sense of purpose, uh, who had lost a sense of meaning in their own civilization, uh, this is in the words of Philip Reeve, they could find meaning and purpose in Puerto Rican culture or black culture. They could go attend black churches or participate in political movements that would advance those groups. And of course, there was also nature, ecology. Ecology, not in terms of basic conservation, but in terms of reuniting with God and some primordial unity or oneness with the environment. And so existentialism was a primary factor in white youth wanting a sense of purpose, and so moving into politics for a lived experience. It was youth groups in the Methodist church and in various churches where young white people would move down into the South and they were going to help register African Americans, or they would march with blacks in the civil rights movement, or they would protest the Vietnam War. Uh, Tom Hayden, who was uh, the leader of SDS, he was very much moved by C. Wright Mills. He wrote his master's thesis on C. Wright Mills entitled Radical Nomad. Tom Hayden wrote his own letter to the student New Left. This would apply C. Wright Mill's personal politics to young white students and how they could carry out the creation of a new left as C. Wright Mills had advocated. Uh, Tom Hayden was also the author of the Port Huron Statement. I should, I should say that the new left was distinct from the old left. The old left was the old labor left, pursuing uh, advancements for the middle industrial and working classes. Tom Hayden's Port Huron Statement had a whole different set of problems. Uh, it argued that there was a crisis of alienation, young people who felt alienated from their society, who were caught in the rat race of getting corporate jobs, those who opposed American interventions abroad, and those who wanted to further civil rights here at home. And so students traveled down into the South, whether the 1961 Freedom Riders or the marches in the South organized by those like King to protest in favor of civil rights and against segregation in the South. They would then carry many of these new ideas back with them to the universities. And in 1964, when a graduate student wanted to set up a core table at the University of California, Berkeley, that's the Congress on Racial Equality, to try to advertise for students to participate in the civil rights movement in the South, the university denied him this. 
the university had said, no, there's only certain designated areas where you can set up these tables, and we're going to be apolitical. Again, the separation of facts and values. When they came to arrest this student, the squad car was surrounded by many other students. One of them took his shoes off and stood on top of the squad car, and they prevented the police from exiting. This began the Berkeley free speech movement. And here you had white students who began to say that the segregation in the South was part of one system within loco parentis at the universities in the North. This was the idea that colleges stood in loco parentis or in the place of parents in educating young people to develop ethically and morally. And so the students protested this because they said the university was simply a liberal training ground that deformed their souls. And so in the Berkeley free speech movement, they began to protest the limitations placed by the university on students. Mario Savio, in his 1964 Sprawl Hall Address, argued that when the corporate liberal machine denies you your freedom to such an extent that you need to throw your bodies on the gear and stop the machine from working altogether. SDS and other uh, student organizations were behind the anti-war protest in 1965 in a march on Washington. The Students for a Democratic Society was just one of many student groups that were organizing an anti-war protest, as well as civil rights protests. The Vietnam War was responsible for the deaths of some 60,000 Americans that were killed in action, another 153,000 that were wounded, and students who were uh, now involved in the draft. In this anti-war rally in 1965, SDS, though it was just one of several groups that advertised for the rally, in which 15 to 25,000 student protesters showed up. SDS was made synonymous with the anti-war movement and it made them famous. Even where college students didn't pay their fees or dues, they still identified with SDS and participated in their recruitment roles. There in 65 in Washington, Paul Potter, uh, the president of SDS, he stood up and he gave his naming the system speech. That meant that liberalism was something bad he couldn't directly oppose it, and so he said, we need to name the system to identify it. Here again, borrowing from C. Wright Mills. Mills said bureaucracy was successful because you couldn't actually identify who made the decisions in bureaucracy. And by such a means, bureaucracy obfuscated who was responsible for the awful decisions. And so SDS was saying, we need to name the system, which they called corporate liberalism, corporate capitalism, where special interest were the ones who determined American policy. And we need to name those bureaucrats and leaders who are responsible for implementing them. However, the student radicals found that they were not in agreement with the American public on the Vietnam War. And so by 1967, uh, leaders of SDS like Greg Calvert argued that more radical means were needed. Calvert decided to apply Mill's personal politics to whites in opposing their own. He argued for consciousness raising, he said the same way that you have uh, third world revolutionaries, that organizers needed to appeal to personal problems so that young people would see that they're not alone, but part of an oppressed class. And in this sense, the students who were subjected to constraints by the universities argued that in loco parentis made them allies against liberal oppression, the same as the bombed out villages in Vietnam. Calvert argued for a new revolutionary movement for change. He called for a white, quote, revolutionary class where whites would go to their own, just as blacks had gone to their own. In fact, SNCC had kicked whites out of their organization in 1967 as part of the black power movement. And so this revolutionary class would ally with minority youth to destroy the, quote, dehumanizing system that existed in white America. If they were unsuccessful in mobilizing poor whites, said Calvert, they must, quote, orient themselves toward third world revolutionaries. They would help, quote, peasant-based revolutions. That meant that the American military, the American corporate juggernaut was itself evil, and Vietnam was a racist, oppressive war. So there'd be a new proletariat of students, social workers, teachers in university, and bureaucrats in government. They would be the vanguard of the new revolution. The idea of being a revolutionary was romantic to many of the young white radicals, one of the favorite films of the Weather Underground was the 1969 film, The Wild Bunch. In this movie, there are a bunch of renegades at turn of the century America, uh, with the taming of the frontier, the rise of the railroads in large corporate America, and they need to find meaning and purpose in a day and age when bank robberies are not so easy. And they find this meaning and purpose in allying themselves with Mexican peasant communities in challenging a dictatorship across the border.
And this is how the young white revolutionaries saw their own role in the United States, is in challenging revolutionaries who were going to overthrow the American government and allying themselves with the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, the People's Liberation Army, and so on. The young white radicals then experienced a tension, where on the one hand, they claimed to appeal to the poor and the oppressed. On the other hand, they understood themselves as being part of an identity politics. Eldridge Cleaver's 1968 Soul on Ice was one of the most popular books of the period for radicals. He himself was a black revolutionary, a black panther. He wrote this book in prison. What Cleaver noted was, was that the great psychic pain, he said, of identity politics would affect disproportionately young whites. He said young blacks had learned to accept and to revere their own heroes, but he said young whites would experience the psychic pain of the demoralization of their own culture. He said they were witnessing the death of their own heroes, the pioneers and the cowboys that constituted the vast majority of primetime television shows and movies, the John Waynes of liberal American society. He said uh, that they were made to feel guilty for all the things that their people had done. And so what could they do? Well, he said they would have to join, they would become allies with blacks in the destruction of the American way of life, quote unquote. There was one white civil rights worker, Charles Levy, in 1968, who noted whites going through this identity crisis. He writes a book called Voluntary Servitude. He noticed that whites placed incredible importance on making black friends in a way that people of other races did not. Uh, and so he said whites, because they placed such importance on this religion of anti-racism, would move down into the South and wishing to gain black trust would exempt themselves from their own race. They would play down their own race. Then they tried to convert to blackness. They would confess their privilege, although they were always suspiciously and ineluctably white. And so they performed humiliating tasks in these civil rights houses, and still blacks didn't trust them. And why? Well, because the black civil rights workers were thinking, why are you here? What do you get out of this? And so uh, whites could never get rid of the fact of their race, even performing humiliating tasks. And so finally, they would reconcile themselves to their whiteness, but now with a higher consciousness, where they would need to become allies in crusading against racism. All of this culminated in the war with the Democratic liberals at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. There, all the radicals had gathered to oppose the war in Vietnam. However, on the floor, the Democrats refused to vote against the war and de facto approving the war in Vietnam. The Union hard hats had dependably showed up to beat protesters in most of the marches. And even here, what you find are the Union members who opposed the demonstrators. In fact, they had very little in common. You had a blue-collar Chicago Police Department under Mayor Richard Daley who looked at all the protesters as privileged white liberals. Uh, the AFL-CIO's George Meany worked with Mayor Richard Daley to suppress the protests. A thousand Americans a month were dying in Vietnam, and all of the protesters believed that it was do or die. There was an existential crisis. And so they marched to the amphitheater, and there they began to hurl bags of feces at the Chicago Police Department to hurl insults. The Chicago PD launched out in violent manner against the students and began to beat them. And all of this was aired on television. So there is this divide in the Democratic Party between the centrist liberals and the radical wing of the party. The protesters thought that if they could endure a beating by the police, they would expose to Americans on primetime television that America was a fascist nation, and via these confrontations, they would drive Americans against the war in Vietnam, and exactly the opposite happened. Uh, polls showed that Americans sympathized with the Chicago PD. Most Americans approved of the war, and even when a majority of Americans turned against it, a large number of those did so because they thought the war was not being prosecuted in the proper manner. So the radicals turn radically left, and they do this in several ways. Uh, one of those ways is that they turned against freedom of speech. Herbert Marcuse wrote a famous essay called Repressive Tolerance, and in this essay, he rejected the idea of free speech. One of his quotes, he said, true liberating tolerance would mean intolerance against movements from the right and toleration of movements from the left. Marcuse's argument is actually pretty good. His argument was that all of those leftists who go into a classroom with liberal professors, when they voice their opinion, the liberal professor will acknowledge all of them at the same time, thereby preserving the status quo and undercutting any of the ideologies or ideals that would challenge the status quo. And so the leftist response was not free speech. 
It was, we should only protect speech that's on the left, and we need to censor all of the speech that's on the right that leads to a fascist outcome and oppressive regime. In 1969, Johann Galtung defined violence as, quote, the cause of the difference between the potential and the actual. Speech was, quote, structurally violent if it led to unequal power and outcomes. And so the new left rejects the liberal notion of freedom of speech as merely a form of oppression via toleration in the universities. And they themselves begin to accept actual violence. In 1969, the SDS leaders split with the Progressive Labor Party. The Progressive Labor Party were the old guard Marxists. They were young people. They were kind of frumpy. They would dress up in suits and ties, but parliamentary, they were excellent. And so they were able to take over SDS, leaving the leadership on the outs. And the leadership was now possessed of the romance of violent revolution. Tom Hayden would lead many of the student radicals in kung fu punches and exercises so they could prepare for the violence that was to ensue. And so with this split in SDS, the radical leadership formed the Weather Underground in 1970. They would put together some 25 bombs until three of them blew themselves up in a Greenwich Village apartment. They continued on the lam for a while until the movement in the Weather Underground eventually fizzled out. In an 18-month period from 1971 to 1972, the FBI reported 2,500 bombings on American soil, five a day that gives you an idea as to the level of the violence during this civil rights period. So we looked at the student new left. Next, let's look at how the student new left advanced identity politics in the universities. Uh, the radicals, if they didn't engage in violence, most of them, many of them, uh, took jobs in the university or in bureaucracy, where they became an ensconced priesthood. They took many of the ideas of the radicals and they developed them into a serpentine catechism of diversity, entire metaphysical systems that became substitute religions that would help people of different identity groups make sense of all of the facts of their life. They forwarded a visionary political regime with cosmopolitan campuses across the world as nexuses of a new global order. They would attack racist, sexist, and capitalist nations. Now, the quantitative social science that was an extension of liberalism, continued on as it did in the universities, and they often ignored those in sociology or those who studied political theory and radical ideals. The radicals wanted to preserve groups and to assign identities, and this would take the place of some of the old metaphysical identity parsing. If you can be assigned an identity, then you can also be assigned the rights and duties that would accompany it, and this was necessary for a social revolution. There was a growing student population, moreover. Hundreds of thousands of professors and administrators would be necessary, and the left saw a way that it could take over education and the bureaucracy to peddle identity, and then with new standards, the compliance with these rules. In 1968, the first black studies program was introduced at San Francisco State University. There were 500 by 1971, uh, and many rich whites donated for these programs and corporate foundations donated for these programs. There were over a thousand by 1971 if you include high school community college programs as well. Women's studies lagged. Women's studies programs rose from 150 in 1975 to over 300 in 1980. Government and corporate foundations sponsored global and international studies programs early on in this period. One good example of how anti-racism took root in the university was in white awareness anti-racism training. One good example of this in the early 70s, and we'll look at some others, is Judy Katz. Uh, her white awareness training began, quote, racism is a white problem. She cited the U.S. Commission on Mental Health, quote, the number one mental health problem in the U.S. was white racism. She said it caused, quote, psychological, sociological, and physical genocide of third world people. The problem, she said, was that whites, because they didn't identify with whiteness, they adopted the liberal view of colorblindness, uh, and insofar as they did that, they quote, lived a personal lie. They denied their role as oppressors in society, therefore, quote, damaging white people's psyche. That meant that they were empirically inferior. She said that white people were empirically ignorant because they were not aware or made conscious of the fact of their whiteness, identifying with whiteness and all of the sins of white people, it meant that they couldn't experience themselves and their culture as they really were. And so we needed to root out the unconscious racism 
She said, quote, the disease of racism runs deeply through every white citizen. And so uh, she combined readings with, quote, white on white encounter groups, end quote, to aid whites, quote, becoming a fully developed and whole person identifying with the culture and their whiteness. And only then could they take responsibility for racism in their society. There were other such programs in the late 60s and on into the 70s. Another example is the 1969 Internal Racism Project at Boston College, introduced by Jane Moosebrucker. Of course, many of the students didn't like it, and she said evidence that the program was needed was the fact that they didn't like it. We conclude now with how those radicals rose to ascendancy in the Democratic Party. After the 1968 DNC, it looked like the Democrat Party was in a shambles. However, party leaders, strategists such as Fred Dutton, who'd worked in California, argued that the heart and soul of the Democrat Party was not what he called the Catholic vote. These were the blue-collar Irish and Italians who voted consistently Democrat, the union members. He said, rather to understand American politics, he said, you have to understand there's a divide between the upper and the working classes. Uh, he forwarded a new demographic theory. He said what was needed was a new activist elite that could represent these oppressed classes and that this should be incorporated into the Democratic Party as the party of the future. There were vast monies that were introduced in spending through the great society. And so uh, these monies could be used to put together this new coalition. And so in what was called the mcgovern Fraser Commission, the Democratic Party changed its own rules. It decided that there needed to be quotas for delegates. And so we needed representation of different groups based on how oppressed they were. Uh, blacks and women would now be introduced into the Democrat Party as delegates. The McGovern Fraser Commission introduced a radical Democratic Party in 1972. It meant that they voted on things that alienated average middle-class voters, things like gay rights and abortion. Even though these things were not officially endorsed by the Democrat Party in 1972, uh, they were still on the platform, they were discussed. George McGovern represented the rift in the Democratic Party. George Meany, Jimmy Hoffa did not endorse George McGovern, neither did Joseph H. Jackson. However, there was something prescient going on in the Democratic Party because they can see the influence of the new left. This is what many scholars today call McGovern's revenge. George McGovern had successfully wooed the non-white vote, some 80% of the non-white vote. He scored 13% better among working women and much higher among educated elites. The party suffered huge losses in the election. They lost 60% to 37% of the popular vote. However, it did introduce a new way forward. The new Democrats in the party would rise to success by playing to these identity politics issues. Probably most importantly was the 1973 Subcommittee Bill of Rights. This is where the new Democrats would punish those senior Democratic members who chaired committees and weakened their power in the House of Representatives. Uh, and so the new Democrats, uh, as they rose to power, particularly the Watergate babies of 1974, the Democrats who were elected on the embarrassing revelations of Nixon spying on the Democratic Party, they would celebrate this identity politics. Television cameras were introduced into Congress, and so the new members would grandstand on television. One of the new things introduced by the Watergate babies was, instead of representing their local constituencies, they would run on these broad national issues before television cameras to 10, 15 second sound bites. What it meant was, is that those Watergate babies in the Democratic Party ate into the party structure that had made the Democratic Party so representative in American politics. So we conclude this discussion of the student new left with one of the great ironies, that in claiming to bring what they called participatory democracy or more democracy to America, that they destroyed it for a radical performance politics that alienated average Americans. And as we move into the 1970s, we find that there's an elite class on both the right and the left who will claim to help disadvantaged Americans, and in doing so, will turn their back on middle-class Americans. <laughs>